Uh, thank you all uh, for sticking around for this talk. What I'm going to be discussing today is work that's going on in my lab at Northwestern in the area of ubiquitous electronics. Uh, ultimately, what we're trying to realize is a strategy by which each and every object in the world could be connected to the internet. This is often referred to as the internet of things. To illustrate that this is the trend we're on, what is being plotted here is the world population and internet connected devices and the number of devices per person as a function of time. And if we look only about 10 years ago, we can see that the number of devices per person was 0.08. In other words, an order of magnitude more people than devices. Fast forward to today and we can see now that we have 25 billion devices and 7 billion people or about three and a half devices per person. And if we look forward, this is just going to grow continually. But this number, while it's growing at a dramatic pace, is far short of the number of objects that we each own individually. And as a result, we have a long way to go before we actually have each and every object connected to the internet. Nevertheless, if we look around, we can see that there are internet connected objects today. For those of you who own a Tesla, you'll know that it is connected to the internet and Software updates are downloaded to your car, allowing you to get better uh, utilization of the stored energy in, your, in the battery pack in the Tesla. Samsung sells smart refrigerators, which will keep track of how quickly you're consuming uh, the food that's in your fridge. Of course, there's uh, wearable electronics, including Fitbit, Ampi, and the Apple Watch. The theme here, though, is that each of these devices is relatively expensive. Uh, there's no way that we could use the technology in the Apple Watch to label each and every object in a Walmart, for example. It's just simply too expensive. And so the question is, how do we get to that point where each and every object is connected to the internet? If we think about Walmart as an example, we know that each and every item is labeled with a barcode or perhaps a QR code. So if there was a way to actually print electronics in the same way that we print barcodes, and that electronics could communicate with the internet, then each and every object could be connected. And so that's the path which we're exploring in my lab. To achieve this requires many things to be required. The first of which is to realize ultra cheap and disposable electronics. Electronics that can be deposited onto substrates such as paper in a manner where you still have active electronic functionality. This requires us to develop scalable production of functional electronic inks. So our lab has done this, so we utilize carbon nanotubes for this purpose. Carbon nanotubes, when they're grown, are highly inhomogeneous. And what you need to do first is to disperse them, and we disperse them in water using simple soap molecules, surfactants. And then we run it through a centrifugation process that allows us to tease out each and every subpopulation of nanotubes in the raw material. This scheme is one which is scalable. Our company, Nanotegris, has scaled up this process 10,000-fold to produce these large volumes of highly homogeneous carbon nanotube inks, which are now used by 700 customers in 40 countries as a printed electronic material. The other material that we're exploring is a more recent entry to the nanomaterial field, namely graphene. This is one atom thick sheet of carbon, won the Nobel Prize in Physics in the year 2010. And the way we're producing it in our lab is to start with graphite, which is essentially pencil lead, add it to water, again with soap, simply sonicate, and that produces a dispersion of graphene, where we exfoliate the graphite all the way down to the atomically thin limit. Again, this can be done in a scalable manner using essentially high-speed blenders. What we then do is we take those electronic inks, and we're going to try to print them into functional electronic devices and circuits using conventional printing technology. So the scheme is shown here. Can we repurpose printing presses, which of course were very common in recent times for printing objects such as newspapers and magazines. That, of course, is a declining trend in the media industry. Can we repurpose those printing presses to realize functional electronics? To do that, we have to take those inks that I just showed you and print them using methods such as gravure printing or inkjet printing and ultimately fabricate from that functioning electronic devices. So this is happening. We've taken our graphene inks. We've controlled the ink rheology. By that, I mean the viscosity of the inks their wetting and drying characteristics. This allows us to print them now onto flexible substrates such as plastics. This allows us to achieve now via simple printing methodology such as inkjet printing, a highly conductive graphene network, and one which maintains its high degree of electrical conductivity 
even following re repeated bending or even folding of the substrate. We can do this not only for inkjet printing, but also more scalable printing methods such as gravure printing. Again, using our graphene inks, we can tailor the viscosity and the rheology to enable this uh, to be printed at very large scale. Uh, you may be aware that gravure printing is used to print most of the currency in the world. And so we've now come up with this scheme for printing electronics with that level of scalability. But we need more than that. In addition to that, we need to have schemes for controlling power management. There's no way we can have these barcodes on each and every object plugged into the wall. Obviously, we need to have very efficient means of running those devices and harvesting energy from the environment. Towards that end, we take our carbon nanotubes, we print them into logic circuits, which allow us to do digital processing of information at very low power consumption. To put this in context, I want to refer you to this plot here on the right, where we're showing the power consumption per logic gate based upon our carbon nanotube devices. And you can see that our peak power consumption at an operating voltage of 0.8 volts is about one nanowatt. To put that in context, a modern day laptop computer dissipates 100 watts of power for a billion transistors or 100 nanowatts per transistor. This is two orders of magnitude lower power consumption. We also need to be able to harvest energy and store it. So using the same types of materials such as carbon nanotubes, we can now develop solution processable solar cells. So these barcodes could be harvesting light, converting it into electricity, which can be stored on ship with the same types of materials and lithium ion batteries. That can then be used to power the devices. The last thing we need is to communicate uh, with the internet, which requires us to show that our printed electronic materials can be used at the frequencies required for Wi-Fi technology. And so in collaboration with the IBM TJ Watson Research Center, which is just up the road here north of Manhattan, we've been able to take our carbon nanotubes out of solution and realize 150 gigahertz operating transistors. This is sufficiently high to do radio frequency wireless communication. We've also taken those carbon nanotubes, integrated them with other materials such as indium gallium zinc oxide. This allows us to make novel PN heterojunction devices. These devices can be fashioned into more sophisticated circuits such as phase and frequency shift keen circuits. Due to limited time, I'm not gonna go into the details of these circuits other than to note that they are foundational elements for Wi-Fi technology. We've now realized uh, these types of devices are utilizing purely solution-based processing. So in conclusion, what I tried to tell you in a very brief talk is that ubiquitous electronics are upon us. They're enabled by advances in nanoelectronic inks. We can now print these devices, and we believe that these printed and flexible electronics will accelerate the Internet of Things due to low-cost manufacturing and seamless integration such as RFID tags and wearable electronics. This will almost certainly fuel further economic growth and improve energy utilization, transportation, healthcare, and other sectors. But it also presents challenges, and that's one thing I wanna conclude with, and that is if we really have each and every object connected to the internet, there will be new challenges for policy. There'll be issues of privacy, legal issues, and these have to be confronted concurrent with the outstanding potential of this technology. And so with that, I'll conclude. I want to point out this is done by a large team of researchers in my research group. I acknowledge them briefly here. Also funded uh, largely by the federal government. I thank uh, them for their support. And finally, thank you for your attention.